Well, good morning in the West and good afternoon in the East. Thank you for joining our webinar. I'm Jessica Groskopf, Extension Educator at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Today is a part of the Center for Agricultural Profitability's weekly webinar series, which usually happens every Thursday at noon Central Time. A full schedule of, of, is available on our website at cap.unl.edu. Today's webinar is brought to you by Nebraska Extension's Land Link Program, which works to connect land seekers and land owners who are retiring and looking to find successors. The land seeker and land owner applicants are matched with the most compatible counterparts to, so that mutually beneficial partnerships can be formed over the course of a transition plan. For more information about the program, visit cap.unl.edu slash landlink. The USDA Farm Service Agency sometimes is called the first lender of opportunity because it can often make loans that our commercial lenders cannot. This is especially important for beginning farmers and ranchers who, for FSA purposes, are those who have not operated a farm or ranch for more than 10 years. While folks still need some experience and a business plan in order to get a loan, FSA may have some flexibility where others do not. Today, we'll hear about FSA and how it can assist beginning farmers and ranchers, including a variety of loan options from direct loans for operating expenses or ownership dreams to guarantee loans where FSA works with local lending uh, institutions to guarantee up to 95% of the loan that the lender makes. Presenting for us today is Kim, a farm loan manager with USDA Farm Service Agency based in Shadron. Kim, thanks for joining us. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you very much for that welcome, Jessica. I appreciate it. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to share some information about our programs with everyone today because the USDA Farm Service Agency does have a variety of programs that are designed to help individuals get started in farming and ranching. In fact, sometimes FSA is referred to as the lender of first opportunity, just as Jessica mentioned, because we can often make loans that other lenders may not be able to make, because as I'm sure many of you are aware, it's, it's very difficult to get started in farming and ranching when you may not have the capital and resources necessary to do so. This is especially important for beginner, beginning farmers and ranchers. And for FSA purposes, Beginning farmers and ranchers are those who have not operated a farm or ranch for more than 10 years. While applicants do still need a farm operating plan and some experience in order to get a loan with FSA, we may have some flexibility in order to help get you started when you may not be able to get that financing at the bank when you want to. So today we'll discuss some of our available loan programs to help you get started in farming and ranching. We'll touch on a few of our safety net programs that can be very important for beginners. And then we'll cover some basic items you'll need in order to get started with the FSA office in order to start that farmer ranch career. Many of you may already know about the Farm Service Agency. Maybe your grandparents or parents currently do business with the FSA. Maybe they've done business in the past or maybe currently are doing business with the FSA. And many other people such as beginners, which may be many of you sitting out there today, may not have heard of the FSA at all. And so for those of you that haven't heard about the Farm Service Agency, we often are referred to as the FSA for short. So if you hear the FSA, it's gonna be the same thing as Farm Service Agency. The FSA is a branch of the United States Department of Agriculture, and we serve farmers and ranchers and rural landowners through the delivery of federal programs, including economic safety net, disaster assistance, conservation, and farm loan programs. This agency, or some form of it with a different name, has been around since the 1930s, and our programs are generally authorized under the Federal Farm Bill 
which comes up for renewal about every four to five years. The FSA mission is to equitably serve all farmers and ranchers and agricultural partners through the delivery of effective, efficient agricultural programs for all Americans to accomplish this mission. FSA has a presence in every state in order to accomplish this mission. This slide here shows you the Nebraska Farm Service Agency footprint. Our agency has 71 county offices or service centers like we typically call them. And they're shown here in the blue and the green counties. If you look closely, the green counties represent the availability of full-time farm program staff, while the blue counties have available both full-time farm program and farm loan staff. The farm loan staff located in the blue counties serve as a hub and provide service to surrounding counties. So for instance, um, I'm sitting here in Shadron, Nebraska, which is up in the corner of the state in Dawes County. And if you wanted to apply for a farm loan in this area, uh, if you lived in Sheridan, Box Butte, Dawes, or North Sioux, you'd apply in Shadron in the Dawes County office. So depending on where you're at in the state, um, a lot of times it may be the closest blue county uh, for the farm loan program, but it could be um, one just depending on how the, the territories are set up as well. Now you may be sitting in a county that is not blue or green at this point. If you're sitting in one that is, is colored white, uh, don't be afraid that you don't have services for that county. It just means that you would have to go to one of your surrounding counties in order to get FSA services. In total, we have about 420 Farm Service Agency staff located across Nebraska in our service centers and the state office. And there along the bottom of the screen, we do have a, a link or a site that you could jot down quick in order to find which service center you would need to go to. Our farmers.gov website has a lot of great information there. And so this is gonna be referenced a few times throughout this, this PowerPoint. And it's gonna be very helpful in finding what types of programs you may be eligible for and interested in. So the focus of this webinar is to make sure beginners understand what we can offer for assistance and what types of programs might be available. So for FSA program purposes, anyone who has operated a farm or ranch for no more than 10 years could be considered a beginning farmer or rancher. So it has nothing to do with age. Uh, you could be 50 years old and decide you want to start farming and ranching and still be considered a beginner. That definition just has to do with how long you have been farming or ranching. One of the programs that we'll talk about specifically is a lot of our land programs. The, the loan program that we use to purchase real estate is something we call our farm ownership loan program. And for farm ownership loans, you can't already own more than 30% of the average farm size for your county in order to still be considered a beginner. So that, that doesn't mean you're cut out of all the programs just because you possibly own more than 30%. It just means that you might not be able to be considered a beginner at that point. We can finance individual operations and also in certain cases, entity operations. One of the important parts to know about an entity application such as an LLC or a corporation would be in order to be considered a beginner, all of the members must be related by blood or marriage and all of the members would need to be beginners as well. And so that's an important point when it comes to applying for our farm ownership loans. So what does FSA do and how can we serve beginning farmers and ranchers? So this slide here does have a list of the two primary program, program portfolios, which provide a comprehensive safety net for all farmers and ranchers. It's the farm programs and the farm loan programs. These programs are built to serve all farmers and ranchers. Within some of them, there's specific provisions to assist beginners. And so 
I'm going to talk mainly about our farm loan programs today and specifically focusing on some of the beginning programs, but we'll also have a brief, brief mention at the end for a couple specific programs that have beginner benefits as well. As I said at the start, at FSA, we actually refer to ourselves as the lender of first opportunity. One of our main functions is to provide credit to ag producers who are unable to obtain credit through normal private commercial channels. So for beginners, as I mentioned, this is often the case because it's very difficult to save up enough for a down payment on a piece of real estate or have enough equity built up in machinery and equipment or a cattle herd in order to get some financing from the bank. In Nebraska, FSA actually has a really great track record. In fact, we're generally, generally a leader in the nation in FSA loans to beginners. So in, in fiscal year 2021, uh, we made 1,949 FSA direct and guaranteed loans in the state of Nebraska. This was the third in the nation. And of those loans that we made in Nebraska, 69% of them went to beginning farmers and ranchers for a total of over $215 million. So that number was the second highest in the nation. And so as you can see, Nebraska is very focused on beginning farmers and ranchers. And we really do take pride in that lender of first opportunity because it's a great place to start. And our programs are going to be ones that you can take advantage of and utilize in order to get a good start in farming and ranching. Hi, Kim. We have a couple of questions in the chat. So, okay. um, and they're both related to the same thing. So I wanted to pause you real quick while we're talking about who qualifies. So the question is, is there information by county um, for the 30% requirement? So there, is there somewhere is. they can find that? Um, I'm not sure if that's something that is online, but one thing that we really suggest that people do is call their local service center. So when we had the map up of, of where you might go and find those services, that service center is going to know what the average farm size is for that county. And so they'd be able to help you determine whether or not you met the qualifications for a beginner based on the county where you'd be operating. And then we have a follow-up question of, does 10 years experience include being a hired farmhand? That's a really great question. So uh, one of the things we're gonna cover a little bit later has to do with eligibility. And so there's a variety of ways that you can gain eligibility for our farm ownership loans. And again, it's going to be a situation of really discussing that with your loan approval official, because it can be things like um, working for a farmer ranch, managing a farmer ranch. It depends what type of responsibilities that you had. And so that is a great question. And it, we always say it doesn't necessarily mean that you've, you've had to have a, a Schedule F, your farm income and loss. It really depends on specifically what type of education and experience that you've got. Awesome. Just as a reminder, if you have questions for our speaker, Kim, um, you can put them in the chat or you can put them in the Q&A. So thanks for that. And um, we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, thank you. Yes, great questions. Okay, so one thing that is, is great about our programs as well is that we don't have the intention of just making the loan and never talking to you again. It's gonna be an ongoing relationship where uh, we're gonna visit with you about your loan, how well things are going out there because our mission is to provide credit successfully with an eventual goal to graduate all of our borrowers to commercial credit. So it's also important to realize that this is a great place to start, but we're not intended to be a forever financer as well because if we can get you started on the right foot and get you to a position where you've got enough equity and got enough capital to get commercial financing at a bank, that's our ultimate goal. One way we do this is through what we call supervised credit. 
And so that means that we're gonna help you evaluate the adequacy of real estate, your facilities, your machinery and equipment. Um, we're gonna visit with you at the end of your production cycle, see what went right, what went wrong, what type of changes you might need to make that can help you to gain uh, better access to your goals for the future. So with this slide here, you'll see that on the left there, it says direct operating and farm ownership. And then the other one is guaranteed operating and farm ownership. So when I say direct loans, that basically means that the funding for those loan programs are gonna come directly through the farm service agency. Your correspondence will be directly through the farm loan staff. And basically we, we make the loan, we service the loan, the questions come through us. For guaranteed loans, that's another program that we have where we actually work with commercial lending institutions and you continue to work with your bank, but the bank might decide that they wanna get a guarantee on that loan, which is essentially one way that the bank can continue to provide financing you're getting a guarantee where they may not otherwise be able to. So we'll cover some of those loan programs in a little bit more detail on the following slides too. An important note is that, um, of course, we've got a government budget and we do actually target a portion of both our direct loans and our guaranteed loans to beginners. So we try to make sure that there's enough funds set aside to be able to finance beginning farmers and ranchers. There's also a special down payment program exclusively for beginners, which we'll also talk about that in the next few slides as well. All right, this first one here is the direct operating loan. So with the webinar being getting your start with farming and ranching with the FSA, I would say that a lot of times this is the area or the loan program that's utilized the most in order to get your start. Uh, with our direct operating loans, those are typically used to finance livestock, feed, seed, farm equipment, uh, purchase machinery and equipment, and possibly even buy a cow herd to get your start. This loan program has a $400,000 maximum. The term is up to seven years, but that's gonna be dependent on what your loan is for. So for instance, if we're financing input costs, such as your feed, seed, fertilizer, some of your annual expenses that is going to go into your production and then your production is gonna be sold at the end of the year, those are probably gonna be set up on a one-year term, depending on when that production is sold. Then we also have up to seven year terms based on the useful life of security. So more than likely, you're not gonna be able to go out and buy a cow herd and pay it all, all off in one year. Um, that payment's gonna be made through calf sales. And then that's why we would set that up on a seven year term is to stretch out that repayment. We have fabulous interest rates. Uh, our current interest rate is 2.25%. So, these couple items, the longer term and the lower interest rate, is one of the reasons that we can be the place that you start your financing, because we also don't necessarily have a down payment requirement or an equity position that needs to be obtained in order to get into this program. So we could provide 100% financing for machinery and equipment or the cow herd. And by stretching out the payment up to seven years with the lower interest rate, obviously that's gonna make that payment a little bit more reasonable and allow you to gain equity in order to get to that commercial credit at the bank. So that one's the direct operating loan. And those are gonna be for your, your shorter loan purposes, such as your annual or your, your cow herd and your machinery and equipment. So the, the next one here is the direct farm ownership loans. So that's the first one of some of our real estate purchase programs. This one can be used to purchase or expand a farm or ranch, construct new or improve uh, existing farm buildings and pay closing costs, pay for soil and water conservation and protection purposes. This one does have a maximum loan amount of 600,000. And this is a fairly recent change. When I started, we had the maximum of 300,000 and that didn't get us very far when it came to getting into land and purchasing real estate. And so it was a, a welcome change when it came up to 600,000 because it allowed us to 
uh, maybe assist a little bit more than we had been able to prior. We do have a maximum term of 40 years. That 40 year term isn't a guaranteed at application. We're gonna help you evaluate what it looks like in your cash flow. If 40 years makes the most sense and looks like it may be a tighter cash flow to where we need to stretch it out to 40 years, it may be that we use that. However, if, if cash flow is good and um, it looks like your repayment ability is very strong, we'll probably bring that down based on five-year increments in order to help you build equity faster and get you to that point where you could get commercial financing. The current rate is 2.875%. It does change monthly, but once your loan is approved and closed, that rate is fixed for the life of your loan, and there's no down payment required either. So we've had two questions come in that, that relate to this topic. So um, for the direct loans, do you need to be turned down by a commercial lender before becoming eligible? Yeah, well... I would say yes in general. And so when we talk about eligibility, one of the eligibility criteria is your ability to obtain commercial financing. So I keep referencing, get commercial financing, get commercial financing. We can't compete with lending institutions, commercial lending institutions, because of course with interest rates like that, we have a lot of the business. So if you can get financing at a bank or you're currently with a bank, we need to ask you to stay there. And that's absolutely great for you if you're able to get commercial financing for your operation. Um, along with some of our programs, there's a little, a little more questions that are asked and a little more guidance that we provide too. So sometimes it's best to stay where you're at. But as far as getting a denial letter, we don't specifically ask for a denial letter, but it's going to depend, depend on the situation too and what type of loan program you apply for. Thank you for that clarification. The next one is what are the interest rates based on with the current increasing rate environment? Does the FSA foresee their rates going up within the next one to two years specifically for the real estate loan? Wow, that is a really good in-depth question. And I am not going to pretend to tell you exactly how they are calculated. What I can tell you is that I have been with the agency about 17 years and typically I haven't seen an increase of any more than a quarter each month. So the beginning of the month, we get our new rates, whatever loan is approved throughout that month gets that rate. And so to see a really big hike, I wouldn't say that that would happen quickly. We usually see very slow progressions in either increases or decreases. Again, just as a reminder, if you have questions for Kim, you can either submit them through the chat or through the Q&A. Um, a follow-up question is, um, what if I have a loan through the bank for a small amount, but I am looking to expand and they won't do a larger amount? Um, is that, does that still qualify for the direct loan? It could. Um, it depends on uh, what I do want to clarify is that we have two direct loans on this particular screen. One of them is a direct operating loan. The other one is a direct farm ownership loan. We can use direct operating loans to refinance certain farm related debts. We cannot use direct farm ownership loans to refinance land debt. So if it was real estate debt, then we would not be able to refinance it. But if it was something um, possibly cattle debt, machinery and equipment debt, um, anything that would have fit under our normal regular loan program purposes, we could potentially look at refinancing it. So what I would say is it's possible and I would sure call your local service center just to see what your options might be. They can ask you specific questions about your operation or what type of debt it is and visit with you about certain programs you could be eligible for. Perfect, that's all of the questions in the chat for right now. Okay. This next program is specifically a farm ownership loan program as well. 
So it is going to be for the purchase of real estate, so purchasing your farm or ranch. As the name indicates, this one's a little bit different than the other ones where we do require a down payment. But if you do have at least a 5% down payment, it's a fabulous program to get into. The reason it is a good one to get into is because as you can see there, we've got a current interest rate of one and a half percent. So that one is set up to where we do have a floor on it and the interest rate is set at the farm ownership rate minus 4% but the floor is one and a half. So that's where we've been sitting for quite a while with this loan program. The term is up to 20 years and our down payment loans can't exceed 45% of the lesser of the purchase price, the appraised value, or our maximum loan amount of 300,150. So if you think about it, if you've got 5% down, FSA can finance up to 45%, and then the other 50% has to come from somewhere. And so typically that's gonna be from a commercial lender or a private lender, and it could even be the seller. So if you had the opportunity to at least get 5% of a down payment put together, this would be a program that your local service center would work with you as well to see which one fits best. Now, one thing about this program is that it is specific to our beginning farmers and ranchers and the socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So that 30% of the average farm size does apply to this program. And it, that doesn't mean that we can't finance real estate at all if you've got more than that or you're not a beginner. It's just this one specifically is only available to our beginners. The next farm ownership loan program that we've got here is our joint financing program. This one can be used to purchase a farm or ranch. Financing is provided jointly with FSA and another uh, lender. So we do not require the down payment on this one. And so 50% from FSA, 50% from another lender. This loan program does have the maximum amount of 600,000. No down payment required terms up to 40 years, and the interest rate is going to have a floor set on it as well, and it's currently at two and a half percent. So this one we see used quite a bit because we do have, uh, we understand it's hard to put even 5% down, let alone possibly 30% down in order to get financing into commercial lending institutions. So this one is one that we see a lot of use in, in Nebraska. The next loan program is our micro loans. So as the name indicates for this one, micro is gonna be a little bit smaller. It does have the maximum loan amount of 50,000. Now there's, there's two portions of micro loans. We have some operating micro loans and then we can actually use the program for real estate purchase as well. If it's used for real estate purchase, we do have the maximum 25 year term the nice thing about our microloan program is that because it's a smaller loan amount, it often does have some, there's some ease in the paperwork and the requirements aren't quite as strict when it comes to applying for the loan. All right, this one is the guaranteed loan program. So a few slides back, I had left, on the left side was the direct loans, and then we had the right side show the guaranteed loans. This is where the guaranteed loans come in. So these allow a lender to make a loan that without a guarantee may be too risky for them. In Nebraska, we partner with lending institutions in every servicing area that work with FSA guaranteed loans. One thing I want to point out about this type of program is that you continue to work with your local lending institution, and they're actually the ones that decide whether or not they would like to get a guarantee on it. So we typically never visit with the guaranteed loan borrower because the bank is technically our customer. With these guaranteed loans, basically we're helping the bank to protect themselves from a loss. 
and we can actually provide up to 95% of a guarantee uh, in certain situations. We do have both operating and farm ownership guaranteed loans, and the maximum loan amount is 1825000 So remember that our direct loan amounts were quite a bit lower, but this one is actually funded by the bank. We just put a guarantee on it, so they're able to lend a little bit more. We do, oops, there we go. We do actually have guaranteed lines of credit that can be for your annual operating expenses, uh, just like we talked about for our direct annual operating loans, feed, seed, um, fertilizer, just your general input costs. And so we also have up to seven year term that can be for your cattle, machinery, and equipment. And then the farm ownership ones can't exceed 40 years, similar to what our direct loans are. The easy guaranteed loans could probably be compared to our micro loans where they're a little bit less paperwork, lower loan amounts, and just really designed for some of the smaller operations or the niche op operations. This next program isn't a, a direct or a guaranteed loan. It's our farm storage facility loan program. This program provides low interest financing for producers to store, handle, and transport eligible, eligible commodities. We do have a $500,000 per loan, maximum loan amount. This one does have a heftier down payment though. In order to get into this program, you do have to have a 15% down payment. There's also a micro loan option for our farm storage facility loans as well with the lower down payment of 5% and the reduced paperwork. So your loan terms are gonna vary and eligible, the eligible commodity list is pretty long. You're gonna see a, a lot of your typical Nebraska crops, corn and soybeans. Um, there's different commodities listed there that could possibly be eligible. There's also a list there of the types of things that we would finance. And some of those eligible structures or facilities or upgrades could include your conventional bins, flat type storage structures, structures suitable for storing hay, bulk tanks for milk, old storage buildings, storage and handling trucks, and that can include refrigerated trucks as well. This program also has a low rate and the three year rate is 1.125, the seven year term is 1.625. And so the interest rate is gonna be dependent on the type of loan uh, term that you get. Here's where we get into eligibility a little bit. So we, we talked about who FSA is, what our history is, what our purposes are, and then some of the loan programs. So now we're gonna transition into what are some of the basic requirements in order to start with FSA and get into farming and ranching and maybe obtain your first loan. So what I have on this slide here are some of your basic eligibility rules. And one of the first ones to be a US citizen, a US non-citizen national or qualified alien, being able to obtain credit elsewhere. So this is specifically what the, the question was about prior where if you can get commercial financing, if you've got a lender that's willing to do what you want to do, then you would not be eligible for FSA financing. You do also have to have a good credit history. So a good credit history shouldn't necessarily be confused with a good credit score. We do pull a credit report, but we're not looking for a certain score. What we're looking for is your, um, your ability to repay past debts. So we're gonna consider everything that's on your credit report. We also usually visit with local lenders if you have a local lender and we're going to be able to help make that determination based on what we see there. Jessica, I see a pop up there. Do we have another question? Yeah, we do. So we have a question regarding um, a young producer who potentially has a minority share in the family entity that owns the family entity owns equipment land livestock but the young producer does not own any land individually how does that play into the qualification entities 
can get tricky. Uh, percent ownerships do take, are something we take into consideration too. And so I would probably have to ask quite a few more specifics about what they have going on. And that is one situation where with it being so specific, I would definitely ask you to call your county office and visit with them about the situation to see what type of program you could fit into, if any, based on what you've, what your interest is in an entity. Thank you so much. All right, I think we left off on credit history. So that next one there is the capacity to secure the loan. So be of, of legal age, uh, controlled substance convictions or something we're gonna look at, not be delinquent on federal, federal debt or unpaid federal judgments, and then managerial ability. So this one also um, references the question that was asked earlier too about what types of experience might apply to that 10 years. One important thing about obtaining a loan and starting your farming operation is that we want it to be a success for you. So part of it being successful is that you have to start off with some experience. Uh, we don't want to throw you into a situation where you're not sure what you're doing because we can provide some financial advice, but we're not going to be out there on a day-to-day -day basis helping you manage it. So for operating loans, you do need to have sufficient education, training, and experience, or at least one year of experience managing or operating a farm within the last five years. For our farm ownership loans, you do have to have participated in the business operations of a farm or ranch for at least three out of the last 10 years prior to the application. So there are situations where we can substitute other relevant experience including possible military service. And so that's where uh, in our applications, we give you the opportunity to number one, say what type of experience you've, you've got, and then also explain what the situation was or what, what your role was in order to help us make that eligibility determination. And then you do also have to be the owner and the operator as well. So we're designed to make sure this is a viable farming and ranching operation. And so we're not set up to finance just investment type situations where you're not out there doing the day-to-day -day labor and management. We really want this to be a successful business for you. So we've got that owner and operator requirement as well. So if you've if you're thinking about one of the programs and, and now you kind of know what some of our eligibility criteria might be, a, a good thing to do is like I've already um, had to kind of tell you to talk to your local service center because there are specific situations that um, may lead you down one path or another. It's a good idea to also set yourself up to have a good first meeting. So when you have that first meeting, it's a good idea to prepare for that. And this slide shows some things that you might wanna think about. So whenever someone would uh, visit with me about want, wanting to go visit with the FSA office, I, I do suggest that you do a little bit of homework first. That way you can visit with your loan approval official about what it is you would like to do. Um, and some of these questions are gonna help you put together what we call your cash flow. And so your cash flow is gonna be your income, minus what your projected expenses would be. Hopefully there's enough of a margin there in order to make a payment. And of course, that's one of the most important things when you go in to request a loan is whether or not you'll be able to make that payment. So if you do your homework and prepare for your first meeting and actually go through some of these questions, you're gonna have a really good start. Now, if, if some of these questions you're not sure about, we can absolutely help you with that as well. So we don't expect you to be able to put together a cash flow just like we would um, because we do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it would be good to look at these uh, questions and at least have a really good idea of what your potential income might be for a certain farmer ranch that you're looking at or what you're intending to purchase. Um, where will you market your product? What type of price do you think you'll get? We do have a set price that we use for most of our cash flows, but knowing what the market prices are and what you can generally expect is a good idea. And then uh, what type of expenses are you, gonna, are you going to have in order to produce that product? 
So um, just really trying to put together a, a business plan for yourself and think about those items as a, and this would be a good reference slide to think about. Part of our application process does ask you for financial records. So it's a good idea to have your financial records organized. And it's also a really good idea to know what's within those. I mentioned a, a business plan on the prior slide there. And so if you haven't already, you can try to draft your business plan on your own, or you can come to the FSA office kind of knowing what you'd like to do. And we can help you think about all the income and expenses that could be associated with your operation. You wanna be prepared to talk about your operation and relevant experience. So we've got a couple questions already on the amount of experience that people might have. And so when you visit with your loan approval official, they're going to ask you questions just to make sure that you understand what it will take and this can be a successful thing for you. Think of your loan approval official as your partner with your business, and they're going to want to help you work through it and ask all the questions in order to make sure this is, this is a good thing that will work for you. I mentioned that farmers.gov has a lot of great resources. And this is one of the resources that you might find on the website there. And it's important because one of the most often asked questions it seemed like was, how long will this application take? How long until I can get my money? Well, I would say that a lot of that does depend on you and how, how well you put together the business plan or your initial application, how quickly you get us the items that we need. And so in general, we, we look at an application and we would let you know what else we need in order to consider your application complete. And during that time, we're gonna be reviewing those documents, putting together the cash flow you've submitted or work with you to put together a cash flow and see what the, your business proposal looks like. Sometimes we're going to have a farm visit there as well. And so if you're looking to purchase real estate, a farm visit is going to be required because we do have to make sure that the property would meet all of our environmental regulations as well. So for every real estate purchase, there's going to be a site visit. And then for other loans, that we would try to assess the viability of the operation as well, which could be your farm visit out there too. So we do try to have a decision to you just as soon as possible. One important note about Real estate loans, though, is that those do typically take longer than our shorter term loans like your annual operating loan or your, your loan for cattle. And the reason is because we also order an appraisal. And so the appraisal is going to be the current market value of the land that you're buying. We have to make sure that we've got a secured loan. And so we do contract that out and get a third party appraisal, which does take some time. And then there's also title work involved as well. So visit with your loan approval official when you start the process to get a good idea of how long it usually takes in that area. Because sometimes appraisers are backed up, sometimes title companies are backed up, and they're going to have a good handle on how things usually go in your specific county. One important note on here as well is we mentioned that we don't just make the loan. We try to make sure this is successful for you as well. So once your loan is closed, there's still going to be contact with the office when you make your payments or change your plan or you have something else that changes in your operation. And so there's going to be different requirements um, over and above making your payment to you that could mean that they're, they're your lifelong partner and trying to get this to be successful for you too. So Kim, we've been having questions come in. Do you want to take those now? Sure. So um, the question from the chat is, if you need an appraisal, uh, how can you bid on a farm at auction? Um, is there a pre-approval process? And that goes with another one. How does FSA assist with buying uh, farmland at auction? Is it possible? I'm glad that question was asked because I actually wanted to cover that and I had I forgot about it on the farm ownership slide. So auctions can be difficult. 
but there is somewhat of a workaround when it comes to auctions. With our application process, we do actually require a purchase agreement on the piece of property that you wanna buy as part of a complete application. So we, we can't even work up an application without a signed purchase agreement, which means we can't do pre-approvals. One of the reasons is because our whole approval is gonna be based on number one, knowing the exact price that we want or that you're intending to pay. Number two, knowing the exact acres, what type of property. So it's, it's different than a, like a mortgage where you're just approved at a certain amount and you can go shop for any type of house that you want under that budget. This is gonna be a business plan that's specific to the piece of property that you're intending to buy. So that's why it can get difficult. However, there has been loans made in the past that were initially bought on auction, but they'd have to be bought on auction by someone else. Our borrower couldn't purchase it at auction because we have to have that purchase agreement. Um, so we've seen situations where maybe a family member buys it at the auction and then once that is completely closed and the family member owns it, then maybe the family member turns around and sells it to our applicant. However, that is, that is at the risk of the person that bought it at auction because we don't have a guarantee that it's gonna be able to be approved without the appraisal, the application, reviewing all the finances. And so I say it's a workaround. Um, because in a lot of situations, we are able to help people out with that. But it's important to note that, we, that our applicant ha can't have their name on um, that piece of land when it is purchased, but it may be something that could be bought uh, from a family member or friend, neighbor, a uh, few months down the road after the auction. Perfect. And that kind of leads into the next question is, does FSA have a template for a business plan? Well, we do. There's, there's a cash flow form. Um, I, I believe it would be available online. There's, we have form numbers. They're FSA 2037 and 2038 are going to be our balance sheet and cash flows. So those are our, our templates. And those are things that actually we send out with the application. And you can use those in order to help work through your business plan. So there's going to be a section towards the, the top that talks about what type of income and it helps you to think through, okay, how many acres, how many bushels, what the price is, potential income. And then on the back side, we do have a section that talks about the different expenses. And so it helps you think through things like uh, sometimes people forget about repairs, but there's a line for that. And so um, it helps you to remember what types of costs might be associated with it. I'd also like to point out that here at the Center for Ag Profitability, um, our last land link sponsored webinar went all the way through um, a business plan template with the University of Minnesota, which has been used quite a bit um, to, to obtain FSA loans. So I'm Great. gonna find those two USDA forms for you. I'll stick those in the chat, but I'll also stick the archived webinar from last month's land link um, that has that information in it. Um, the other one, we've got two other ones. Um, you said you have to have prices for production. Do you have limits on the inputs? For example, no more than X dollars to purchase a herd bull. Ah, well, usually that is a little bit negotiable based on certain things. So sometimes our registered stock are a little bit harder to finance because we have to look at it from a perspective, a lending perspective, where should something go wrong in the operation and we had to turn around and sell collateral, what could we reasonably get out of it? So most of the time, we aren't gonna loan more than market value for breeding livestock. And when I say market value, that's gonna be more than likely your typical sales at uh, a livestock auction barn. Uh, there can be cases where we could loan more but it's gonna depend on what type of equity you already have in livestock or um, maybe equity and other bits of machinery and equipment to where we still have to maintain enough collateral to secure the loan. And so each person's situation is gonna be a little bit different. But if you, if you had nothing 
and wanted to go out and, and buy an expensive bull, um, there, that would be a little bit more difficult just because we also look at the resale value. Awesome. Our last question that's currently in the Q&A is, do you have to be working full-time on the farm to qualify for these loans or can you be working somewhere else? One of the requirements for our real estate loans is that we have to have three years out of the last 10. So that little criteria there that says out of the last 10 could give you some flexibility on whether or not you're currently working on the farm or ranch or not. So that's where that application is going to become pretty important and describing how you meet some of those requirements. And a lot of times we will say, you know, what have you been doing the last 10 years? Or do you have any experience within the last 10 years? Same thing with your operating loans. If it was in the last five years, we can take a look at that as well. So you may not have to be currently working on the farmer ranch, but we do have to make sure you have the sufficient education and experience to make it a good operation. Again, we just have a few minutes left with Kim. So if you have any questions, you can stick them in the Q&A or in the chat. Okay. So Jessica, does this stop right at noon? That depends on how fast I go through the next slides. I think it depends on how long you would like to stay on. So <laughs> okay. It's up to you. you. We usually cut it off at an hour, but if you're willing to stay on and answer questions, we can, we can hold the remaining questions until the very end of your slide set, if that helps because okay. I think you've got good information. We've got 34 attendees on who are, who are asking questions left yeah. and right, so. Okay, that sounds great. Well, I'll, I'll keep going through the slides here and yeah, maybe we'll wait and answer some questions at the end that maybe the next slides might answer some of those for them. All right, so a lot of the information that I just went through was the farm loan information. Uh, here is that farmers.gov link as well. There's also a farm loan discovery tool that if you're not quite sure which loan program you want to get into, I do suggest you get on this farmers.gov and kind of click through some of those questions that'll help you decide which way you want to go. All right, now we're going to get into some of the farm programs. And I wanna highlight some specific programs that have beginning farmer provisions. And these are important to be aware of as you begin to widen your scope of the programs that we have access to within FSA. For the farm programs portfolio, FSA has a variety of programs covering both crops and livestock. Many of you may be familiar with some of these acronyms and they do have, uh, they do stand for a longer program name. So we'll move on to that next slide as well. So here is a list of many of the farm programs and these programs are available generally to any producer. You can see that there's four highlighted there that have specific beginning farmer provisions. So for example, the dairy margin coverage program is a safety net program. It helps dairy operations with risk management, insurance, and it's an insurance type coverage. The important thing to know about this is if you're a beginner who is going into dairy production, ask about the program because the administrative fee for basic coverage under this program is waived for beginners. The other programs with the special uh, provisions for beginners are ones we need to let you know about, but hope you never need because they are in response to national disasters. So for NAP, the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program, this is kind of like a crop insurance, but it's for crops for which there is no commercially available insurance product. So for specialty crops, such as fruits and vegetables, grazing land, and in some areas it includes alfalfa, beginning farmers raising these covered crops can get some basic coverage for free and buy up coverage at premiums that are cut in half. You do have to enroll in these programs ahead of the production season, so ask about it at your local FSA office. The other one there, the Emergency Conservation Program, it's a cost share program to help producers repair land and fencing damaged as a result of a natural disaster. The cost share amount is 75% of the cost of restoration practices, but for beginners, it can actually be up to 
And the takeaway for this program is that it, with it being a disaster program, sure hope that we don't have to utilize it, but it could be an option to help you recover from a disaster. The other programs that don't have the beginning farmer program or the farmer provisions listed, um, ARC PLC is specific to commodity crop production and is an economic safety net, while LIP, ELAP, and LFP are all disaster response programs. The CRP program, a lot of people have typically heard about the CRP program, it stands for Conservation Reserve Program. You might be wondering why we included this slide as CRP actually takes land out of production under a contract and the terms can run up to 15 years but this webinar is about finding access to land. So the point of this slide has to do with the, the final bullet there is that there's some special opportunities for beginners. The CRT, CRP TIP program allows individuals who have CRP contracts that are nearing the end of their term to transition to those, those acres to a beginning farmer and rancher. And in exchange, the owner can receive two additional years of rental payments from FSA. So it's an opportunity for a landowner to receive a financial reward for the federal government for partnering with a beginning farmer. So we often get asked if there's a list that can be viewed of people who may have CRP contracts that are expiring. And unfortunately this isn't available, but you may be able to build some partnerships or relationships with people in your area who you've noticed could have CRP ground, and then start those conversations to see if it's something they may want to transition to you. The important part about getting started with FSA and being able to have access to some of those programs that we talked about is to register your farm with the FSA. So one thing that you're gonna need is proof of identity, like your driver's license, You'll need proof of ownership if you actually own the land, so a copy of your recorded deed, or if you're just leasing the property and you've got a written lease, a copy of that lease. And then the entity identification status if you're an entity, such as articles of incorporation, trust, or estate documents. Bringing those things into the office will allow us to work with you one on one. We can review your documents and help you get registered and get a farm number with FSA. Registering your farm allows you to apply for FSA and other USDA programs. And after we determine your eligibility to participate in the programs and loans, we can walk through the application process, get more information as needed, and it depends on the program as well. So I always thought it was great when we would have a new customer come into the office. And it, it might depend, you might start with the farm programs or you may start with the farm loans and your local service center is gonna collaborate with each other that says, yeah, you know, you, you may be interested in learning about some of these programs. Let's have you visit with this person in our office and really get you started and help you to learn everything that might be available to you through the FSA. So one of the best things you can do is call your FSA farm loan team or farm program team in your local county office. They're gonna be the ones with the local knowledge that help you to know uh, which programs you might fit into based on what typically happens in the county that you might live in. And so we've got some, some websites listed here that are great resources for you. Uh, my contact information is there as well, but I still do encourage you to visit with your local service center. All of our loans are processed locally through the service centers. So um, they're gonna be the ones that will be the ones that answer all the questions for you. So with that, Jessica, that was the last of the slides that I've got today. So we can entertain any more questions. Absolutely. So the first question we have in the chat, and again, if you have a question, go ahead and populate those into the chat or into the Q&A so that we can get those answered. The first one is if you work on the farm part-time while going to college, and earning your ag business degree, how does that work for constituting your three years? That is a situation that we do run into quite a bit. So the determination would be made based on what you put in the application as far as what role you play. 
Um, if it is just a situation where you're, you're going back once every six months to kind of help a little bit, that's going to be looked at a little bit differently than if you're going to college, but close enough to go home and actually provide the management and labor for your operation every weekend. So again, um, being able to explain exactly what you're doing in that application or to your loan approval official is going to be really important in helping to determine whether or not you can meet that eligibility requirement based on education and experience and the owner operator. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I'm gonna give a last call for questions um, for Kim. You did a wonderful job handling all of that. Um, just <laughs> as a you. reminder, uh, recording of the webinar will be posted at cap.unl edu where you can register for our upcoming webinars um, on monday we are having a special webinar which is our agricultural land management quarterly webinar and it will be the first look at the 2022 uh, cash rent and leasing uh, survey so make sure you join us on monday for the preview of our cash rent survey again you can register online at cap.unl.edu I'm still not seeing any questions in the chat. Please make sure that you do go ahead and take our evaluation using the link in the chat box. Um, that's a brief survey to provide feedback on the webinar and inform us about our upcoming session. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks again, Jessica, I appreciate it. Thanks, Kim.